Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 8 of Footmarks, in which I, your host, Bairam Kazi, am going to talk to Jared Kimber about all the nonsense that has gone on in Ashes 2023. So this is going to be one of those episodes with a lot of comic relief. So fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> Jared, you've covered a bunch of Ashes by now, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm going to guess probably starting Ashes 2005 or maybe earlier. You can probably correct no, me. But I was later. Not, not 2009 was my first one. Okay. The, the Freddie Flintoff Ashes. Yeah, of course. You, you have a book there, on that there, as there well. There might be a book about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we've seen a lot of weird shit happening on and off the field in this Ashes. So would you say that out of all the Ashes that you've seen up until now and covered, does this one top the charts? Yes, I think 20, 2009 was weird because it was the first one after 2005 in England, right? Mm-hmm. So there were things like, I've got this memory of like a giant inflatable Shane Warne um, thing being put up. And maybe that might have been the same ashes that they put like a, a picture of Shane Warne up on Big Ben, like in some sort of rebel marketing um, Hmm. Uh, thing 2010 11 i remember that i don't know i don't know how many people actually remember this but 2010 11 the australian uh, cricket australia decided to have like a i don't know uh, like a reality tv style thing where they were going to start with 20 names and and um drop one a day at a time hmm. until they got to the 11 and they announced this in sydney harbour uh in the rain no one turned hmm. up the Australian selectors hated the idea, didn't want to be involved with it at all. They couldn't work out what their team was anyway. The whole thing went absolutely to hell. So mm. it's not like there hasn't been nonsense before, you know, and you see these sorts of things pop up at times, right? You know, uh, the, the Stuart Broad, the, the, the two Stuart Broad moments, which would be mm-hmm. the edging in 2013, you know, into the, the keeper's uh, leg or glove or whatever it was and goes into slip. And then everything that happens in the, at the Gabba test that follows that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, short broad is a ship bloke t-shirts and uh, <laughs> the, a, a newspaper just be, a, behaving like a three-year-old child for no reason, um, if you call that a newspaper. But, um, <laughs> you know, and so, and, and then, so we've certainly had those things happen. And it's not any big test series, and you would know this ha- from having covered Pakistan a little bit now, mm-hmm. the bigger test series have more, nonsense thrown in mm. I, I was talking i was talking to someone actually about this so the alex carey haircut story uh-huh. right, which i'm sure we'll get to but we, w- we were talking about whether that story makes it to the press let alone mm. in a prominent way if it wasn't in ashes and one and one of the other journalists i was i was there with was like it probably doesn't because you do hear stories quite often of you know players going to restaurants and having fallings out with managers and you know not mm. getting the food they wanted or whatever that may be or, or failing to pay a taxi right? it very rarely makes the press and, and of course even when the Sri Lankan players you know uh were outside the bubble during that series they ended up getting you know lifelong suspensions some of them although no one actually got a lifelong suspension but you know they got these big suspensions and everything it barely made a ripple outside of cricket, right? It was certainly reported mm. and it was huge in, in Sri Lanka, but in England, it barely got a mention. Whereas, mm. w- you know, when these things happen in the ashes, they are blown up. But this one does seem to have, even for the ashes, a far <laughs> higher amount of just absolute pure nonsense happening on a near daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you bring up the Alex Carey story because, I mean, when I read that headline that Alex Carey hasn't paid for a haircut and now you have the barber's picture coming up, I was like, okay, this just sounds ridiculous. But then you have Alistair Cook coming up and it turns out that he was Alistair Cook's barber. And that's how the story got leaked. And uh, I mean, Steve Smith came out and debunked that story right away. He said Alex Carey hasn't even gotten a haircut on tour. Just the fact, I mean, I mean, free publicity for the hairstylist. Well, good for him. I know a little bit about this story. I didn't write uh-huh. about it, obviously, because why? I didn't wouldn't. But I know a little bit about the story. From what I know, um, mm-hmm. it uh, it was Jimmy Pearson, the other wicketkeeper, who mm-hmm. had got his hair cut. He didn't realize. So in Australia, it would be very rare for you never to pay with a card when getting a haircut. Mm. Whereas in England, most hairdressers, well, certainly most barbers that I go to, only take cash. Jimmy Pearson didn't realize this. He tried to go around the corner and get some money. It didn't work. And he made an international transfer, as you and I do know a lot about, international transfers, <laughs> uh-huh. especially the first time people don't always work particularly well. Uh, mm-hmm. if, I'm not sponsored by this company, but if you want to use the Wise app on your phone, <laughs> it makes, as Bayram, that's how I pay Bayram. 
Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it works a lot. It lo- works a lot quicker than anything else does. But the po- the point is that mm-hmm. this becomes this big um, thing because Alistair Cook is interested in the story of it, right? Mm. In a normal time, he wouldn't have said that. He wouldn't have gone on air to say it. The person from The Sun wouldn't have gone down to the hairdresser in question to be able to do that, right? All those things needed to happen, and that's what happens during an Ashes that doesn't normally happen. So you do get a lot more general nonsense, and then you end up with Alex Carey, who hasn't had a haircut in The Sun for not paying (laughs) a haircut. It's such a bizarre moment, but we've seen them occasionally with, you know, the BGT stuff, you know, Mm. Indian players at restaurants and, uh, you know, the Australian team were in Zimbabwe a few years ago and we're, compl- well, quite a few years ago now, but we're complaining mm-hmm. about the quality of the Wi-Fi. These things happen. They don't usually end up in the non-cricket part of the media. Yeah, and, and like I said, weird things have been happening on and off the field. And I mean, I, I think I saw this tweet in which there were pictures of Alex Carey from different parts of his career and he had the exact same hair. So I'm convinced that Alex Carey cuts his own hair at this point. I but, like that. I mean, Cook apologized as well and it's all water under the bridge. But It was, uh, a, it was, a, like, it was a weird apology. Yeah, it was a weird apology. Like it was, now we he have. said something like, something may have been mentioned on the show the other day. No, 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 you mm. mentioned it. You started a whole yeah. new which is fine. I don't know Cookie well enough to, to be 100% mm-hmm. sure on this, but there's no way he was thinking, I'm going to say this thing and it's going to mm. end up in the sun and it's going to end up being the Cricket Australia are going to be debunking it. He thought yeah. he was passing on some knowledge. There should have been more due diligence from mm-hmm. you know the, the production side and everything else when he said that, or at the very least, he should have said allegedly, all those sorts of things. And, I don't think Alex Carey is going to sue him for defamation. Yeah, well, if I'm that barber, I'd be very, very happy. And the fact that we've gone to these unprecedented levels of bizarre, it does seem a bit convenient to label the most hated Aussie probably right now as a thief after that Bearstow stumping, which we could probably have a podcast of its own on that. And also the fact that he's been very, very shrewd behind the stumps with his positioning, which has accounted for a fair few English wickets, hasn't it? Yeah, in fact, Bairstow has started doing that same thing of, of setting up down the leg side. So clearly, uh, as, as your dad walks in the background, dad, uncle? Nah, that's my brother. Brother, yeah. okay. I saw, it was definitely a man, um, or I hope. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got that bit right as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think from that perspective, you, do, you certainly have... Um, th- there's so much nonsense around Carey at the moment that it makes sense that that kind of a story would become a bigger issue. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't know how much any of this is affecting Kerry, but I, mm-hmm. I'd be shocked if outside the first couple of hours of just like, oh my God, there's a story about this that is just blatantly untrue. I would have thought mm. after that, as a pro- you're talking about someone, I don't know how many people know that much about Alex Kerry, but he was a professional footballer. He was expecting to play Aussie mm. Rules football. AFL. Yeah, and he, he was involved with the franchise team and uh, a new franchise and he thought he was going to be on that path that didn't work he then so he's at what the age of I want to say 2021 he goes back into cricket now Mm. it's hard enough to be a professional cricketer when you start at a young age and play it all the way through as your only sport to be able to go and actually try another sport and come back and we know that you know clearly there have been Aussie rules footballers who've played cricket at times but that was more in the amateur days even in Shane Warne's era Mm. when when he was involved To be able to do it at this era is very, very tough. Mm. Alex Carey is a very remarkably um, uh, resilient kind of character. But Mm -hmm. it is, you know, there's that. And then there's, you know, one of the most read newspapers in the country talking about your Mm. fake haircut. Yeah, well, they would post anything under the sun. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, Alex Carey seems like the sort of bloke who's not even reactionary. Like, he probably doesn't even care what's being said about him in the media. But speaking of bizarre, you've probably come across a lot of great literary works of your generation, Jared. Where would you rank Ollie Robinson's columns for wisdom (laughs) in those works? (laughs) So, I don't want to out the wisdom people too much here, but (laughs) there's obviously people at Wisdom who have a relationship with Ollie Robinson. Which, mm-hmm. which is weird in itself because, of course, it was Wisden who started the Azim Rafiq um, mm-hmm. story. So it's, it's yeah. bizarre with, with Ollie Robinson's history, um, you know, of his tweets and everything that he's ended up at Wisden. But he has a relationship with some of the people there. Hmm. And I think he wanted to write the column. I think this is right. This doesn't always happen. 
In fact, most players who even sign a column don't want to write their column. But I think mm -hmm. in, in Ollie's case, he wanted to be involved with the column. He would have been put together with uh, a uh, ghost writer, of course. Mm -hmm. Ollie Robinson is not sitting at the laptop. But it is mm -hmm. a really, truly bizarre situation to have England having lost a test match mm -hmm. and then have that column come out. And I originally thought, and this is from doing a little bit of digging, that it looked like the ECB hadn't seen that column at all. Mm. It now looks like maybe they had seen that column. So they wanted what Ollie Robinson was saying mm -hmm. in that to come out. So it wasn't like he went completely rogue. But the fact that he would announce that in the change room, they said it fell up that we've won. I, I've, at a certain point, there, there are probably, if you're really being honest, as you know, and I'm an analyst, not a coach, but as someone who's been mm -hmm. in those environments, there are certainly times in that environment where even when you win a game, you actually want to say to everyone, guys, we've won that game. But if we're being really honest with ourselves, we could have lost that game at any point, right? So right. Let's, let's, let's take what we need from this game, be happy that we've got the win, but actually work on our game going ahead. And in McCullum's case, the opposite here, right? I, mm. I, that makes 100% of sense. Saying it publicly that it felt like we've won and that Australia weren't playing as cool a cricket as we were just makes you sound like an idiot. There's no other way yeah. of, of, of spitting that right. Ollie Robinson and Brendan McCullum looked like idiots at that point, right? Mm. Now, let's say something miraculous happens from, from when we're recording this and they end up coming back and winning 3-2. That's mm. not going to make McCullum look less like an idiot <laughs> yeah. for what he said in that first test, right? And, and the fact that, you know, obviously went on to lose that second test just shows how silly it was. But then Zach Crawley would go out and say a, a similarly bizarre, weird thing of, we're going to win this test by 150 runs. And I think you and I mm. might have covered this on another podcast, but it starts with the fact that how does he know who's going to bat first? <laughs> Yeah. Right? It's such, a, it's such a weird thing to say. And it, I think it did show at that point that they were much more, much more worried about their image. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you, you made some really good points about this. Maybe it was on this podcast last week about the image side of things. But again, it makes Zach Crawley look like an idiot. Even mm -hmm. if Zach, and Zach Crawley's had a, you know, he's average 32, so it's above his career average. There's a lot of pressure on, on him, you know, going up against Pat Cummins and Mitchell Stark and Scott Boland and Josh Hazelwood and all, all you know, incredible mm -hmm. bowlers. Why come out with a, with a statement that everyone is going to laugh at? It, it was such a bizarre thing, but they clearly wanted everyone to mm. feel like, oh, the first loss didn't matter. But it just meant that it just amped up the jokes, right? And it's, yeah. the jokes are going to come anyway. The jokes are going to come naturally. Don't give people punchlines um, when they basically barely need to even write the setup to the joke. Yeah, he also wrote something in the aftermath of the second test match. I think it was something along the lines of the legacy that we're trying to build. We shouldn't be looking at these small things. Stop talking Rob about Robinson? yourself as... Yeah, that Robin Robinson yeah. said that in his second column. So stop talking about baseball as if you're this cure to all of yeah. test cricket. Like Everyone enjoys it. We appreciate what you're doing. We enjoy this new genre of test cricket, but it's not the only way to test, uh, play test cricket. And Australia are proof of that. And um, in terms of the actual cricket played in this series, there's a lot of weird stuff that's happened. Of course, we saw the short ball barrage in Lords from both teams, England more so. And then the field placements that came with it. Would you say that was the most unique thing we've seen in cricketing terms? Or was it Nathan Lyon coming out to bat, hobbling and limping, you know, with a limp in three quarters, and then being attacked with the short ball once again. <laughs> uh, I think that's a good shout, because had he copped one in the helmet, Australia would have probably opted for a concussion substitute, which would have really, really, well, not helped England at all. No, it was a bizarre moment for England. Yeah, I mean, that mm. was weird. The whole thing about that was weird, right? You, you have Nathan Lyon injured, and mm. so... The only way he can get on out on the ground and not be timed out because of the way that Lords is, is by him having to actually um, stand in the long room. I still find mm. it incredible that they didn't have like a stool, like that no one mm. could find a stool for him to sit on. Um, I mean, maybe he was offered one and he didn't want it. Uh, you know, at, they, the, the chairs in Lords are big and heavy. Um, here's the funny, the fun, one of the funniest things that happened in cricket for me was that my, I've got a photo of my oldest son on the Queen's mm. chair when, when, uh, when she had a chair. I don't think she has a chair anymore, uh, Baron, but uh, probably um, not. Uh, but yeah, uh, the big chairs are big and heavy. Maybe they couldn't bring it into the other room because they wouldn't have had any yeah. in the long room because it's standing room also, only, only. So also, I'm glad that the bear store stumping hadn't 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 happened till then because then that long room stay for Nathan Lyon would have been very very interesting, wouldn't it? It would have been, been very. Crazy. It would have been like him being in the crowd, right? It mm. would have been a completely different uh, situation. So yeah, so I do think from that point of view, um, 
That is bizarre. But the field placements are... It's something I haven't covered that much yet. But I have a whole piece mm -hmm. on... We essentially have invented a new fielding position in this mm -hmm. series that hasn't been discussed yet, which is... And it's not inventing a new fielding position because it has existed. But there's a fielding position called straight hit. I'm assuming mm -hmm. you know what I mean when I say that. It's a, the, basically a fielder standing directly behind the umpire on, all the way down on the boundary. You can't have a short straight hit. You can't have someone inside the, the uh, circle, although we have seen that fielder used for malingering um, batters like Cameron White and Kyron Pollard before at times. Uh, but England don't really, especially for the spinners anymore, have a long on or a long off. Mm -hmm. They've given up on that, and they're just splitting the difference and putting a fielder almost directly behind, you know, whichever angle works best, because obviously you, it's a bit tricky to have a fielder directly behind the boulder uh, because they might move. And mm -hmm. so much so that in Edgebaston, they were actually told that the fielder was moving when the bowler was coming in, and so that they had to stay still. That's not something that you generally get in cricket. And so you could then throw that in with all the different fields we've seen for um, the Bouncer Wars, not even mm. mentioning the fact that we have had... I don't, I don't, I've lost count. I would have to go back through all my notes to work out how many times we have had nine fielders on the boundary in a test series. But I'm yeah. willing to put money on. We have never had nine fielders on the boundary as much as we have in this particular series. It's been bizarre. Sometimes you are looking at the game. And it does not look like the cricket that you grew up with mm. at all. And it is such a weird thing. And a lot of this, and we haven't even mentioned the, the ring field that Ollie Robinson had for uh, Joe Quaja. Uh, for Quaja. Yeah, I'm going to say for yeah. Joe Root. I don't know why he'd be bowling to uh, Joe Root in my <laughs> mind. But uh, it's, you're just looking at these bizarre different fields over and over again. And it's, it's I, I'm trying to remember, it might have been in the last test, there was a time when, there were fielders out on the boundary and there'd been mm. this big long discussion between the bowler. It must be Mark Wood and Ben Stokes. I think this is right. I don't think it was, I don't think it was Australia bowling. They had this huge discussion and at the end there was just a bunch of fielders out on the boundary holding their hands up and Mark Wood just came in and bowled and there was none of those guys were in the right position. <laughs> they didn't know where they were supposed to be and it's because I think even Ben Stokes had forgotten which boundaries he had people on. Yeah. Uh, we've also seen the Lord's members act out of character. They gave Khwaja an earful and, uh, well, pretty much all the Australians an earful. And Matt Renshaw had some interesting reactions to that. I, I don't know if everyone caught that picture or not. But can we expect the Lord's members, well, the next time the Ashes is back at Lord's, can we expect them to be wearing Stuart Broad face cutouts or maybe Will Grace face cutouts because he did... The exact same thing all those year, years back, more than a century ago. I love that you call um, WG Will Grace. I think that mm. should be a thing because also we, I don't know, we, um, we used to do a show for me and um, with me and Andy Zaltzman and we used to use the Will and Grace logo um, <laughs> uh, from the old TV show. So I love that you do. Uh. Um, yeah, I think it was, it was fascinating for many different reasons. You know, you've got, I think it wasn't a particular... It's the second time in this series that Usman Khawaja hasn't really done anything to anyone. Mm. And random English people have started to yell at him. Uh, mm -hmm. And the first group was, of course, Ollie Robinson, who has a history of sending those tweets. Uh -huh. we can move, even if we move that to the side and just say he was just frustrated with the batter on... What, on I was going to say one day, but it was more than one day. But um, it's a bad look. And then you've got the Lords members again mm. getting involved with Usman Khawaja as the ICAC report is coming out. Uh, the, you know, there's, there was a, there's a great media watch. There's a TV show in Australia called Media Watch, which goes through mistakes by the media. And people just expect the Lords members to be so posh that someone made up a bunch of posh names of the members who were suspended. <laughs> and everyone in Australian media ran with them, right? They just believed yeah. that these... I'm talking about, like, Mark War uh, was, <laughs> was had them out. You know, all these radio stations, TV shows, mm. were li literally reading out these fake names. It's hilarious. And, and, and so... What you what you really have at that point is we already feel a certain way about Lords, right? You mm. would have your feeling about Lords. I have my own personal, uh, you know, feeling about Lords. I think a lot of people who don't come from the, you know, privileged 1% of society certainly have mm. a, a very clear feeling about Lords. Uh, there are a lot of people within cricket who don't think Lords should be looking after the laws of the game, for mm. instance. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I made the point in the video that you have an institution who... Uh, well, I take it to another level. They 
they tried to get rid of the Eaton versus Harrow school game from Lords, mm-hmm. and yet it was only very recently that the Middlesex women ever played a game at Lords. Um, the England women never used to play at Lords either, and women weren't even allowed to be members at Lords. Mm. There, there's so many issues within the Lords memberships, within uh, or the membership itself, and everything else. But we do think about Lords, uh, the members, uh, a particular way, and to see them turn into the same kinds of fans that you get in other venues, I think mm. it, there's a bit of Schadenfreude there right because they get special treatment uh Mm -hmm. and the fact that they were very upset about the very laws that their own club has written just Mm. made the whole thing funnier right they're literally being angry at a thing that if they really cared (laughs) about it they could get involved with right they're all the lords when the when the laws change in cricket the lords um uh, you know uh membership don't usually have a big say, right? They don't mm. want to have a big say. They want to leave it off to a bunch of cricket nerds to work out what the laws should be, right? Mm. But when Eaton versus Harrow game was going to be cancelled, a school game that should not be played at Lords, that should not mm. have been played at Lords for the last hundred years, if we're being completely honest, right? Shouldn't mm. they? Maybe since the end of the uh, 1800s, they have. A, that was when they got up in arms and they wanted to save it. It's such a ridiculous caricature place at times, and to see that. Uh, you know, I think there was, as I said, a schadenfreude of it, of just like, oh, so they think they're separate to us, but actually now they're being suspended and they look like just like any other cricket mm. fan. And not even a smart cricket fan in this case. Not even a cricket fan, honestly, because when I think of cricket fans, I don't think of rowdy fans who aren't appreciative of the opposition. Yeah. That's something very football-esque. And we've heard many stories of English football fans being hooligans and uh, the loss versus Italy in the Euros comes to mind where they beat up a bunch of Italian fans. Well, this had that touch and feel to it, right? I mean, it's not something you expect from the Lords members, whatever view you have of them, because I know I understand that many different people would perceive them differently. And I think Usman Khwaja said the same thing. But coming back towards the cricket, not so much off-field and on-field stuff, Let's talk about baseball and the impact that that has had on this series because how could we not? And mm. I think the main takeaway probably would be that uh, the baseball shuffle, as you have coined it, a lot of batters are coming and batting outside their crease. We'd seen it from the English guys, but even a lot of Australian batters have employed that sort of strategy. Manas Labushain comes to mind, so does uh, Usman Khwaja. And as a result, keepers from both sides have also started keeping up to the stumps versus bowlers who are bowling 85, 86 miles per hour. So it's not like they're slow, medium paces, right? Mm. This is very, very new and unprecedented. And I think that could probably be the best bit of weird stuff that we've seen all ashes. It's, it's a remarkable thing to see the wicket keepers come up to, you know, this kind of bowling. You see it at the end of test matches sometimes when the mm. pitch really slows down. To see it early on in test matches like we have is remarkable. Mm. And then you see Mitch, Mitch Marsh, who hasn't played any first-class cricket, isn't known as someone who uses the crease. Most tall batters don't use the crease as much, right? Because naturally, mm. they use the crease better than everyone else, right? One step right. Is, is them coming down the wicket. <laughs> but seeing Mitch Marsh get outside the line, come down the wicket, and even use his feet um, against the fast bowls occasionally, you're just like, this is everyone. And this is the <laughs> first series where I think we've seen it as widespread. I think at the end of the New Zealand-England series, it was starting to happen. And, you know, I've obviously written about that before. But this is the the next level where both teams are now looking at doing it. And it has changed the batter-bowler dynamic again, right? Hmm. And I would guess now that there would be very few players around the world. And we're already seeing more and more players using this method. But I think there'd be very Hmm. few players around the world now who, when conditions were in favor of the bowlers, wouldn't be trying this a little bit just to put the bowlers off. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a bit like the wobble ball. When I mentioned this, old players mm-hmm. go, oh, wow. Javid, me and dad <laughs> used to do this. I'm like, yeah, he did. And he was really good, right? Mm-hmm. Or Courtney Walsh used to bowl the wobble ball. Yeah, that's why he took a million wickets, right? So yeah. the point is that what it's really doing is that Baz Ball has taken a few really good ideas and mm-hmm. then is doing exactly... Baz Ball is doing in, in a faster period of time what English cricket did before with the wobble ball which is take mm. a really good theory, and now everyone has the chances to get it really quickly. And it is so bizarre to watch Joe Root. And Jimmy Anderson ran down the wicket in the, in, in the match at Lords mm. and was hit in the face, right? So you've got Tay Lenders even trying this tactic now. Yeah. Um, it, it has spread so quickly. So I think you're right. Uh, it really is something else. And, and then the other thing, just to get back to the field from before, is mm. you know Australia starting with three players on the boundary, right? It's, 
you might get that for Gale or San Jose or you know um, uh, those sorts of those sorts of openers. Sewag is probably another one, right? Mm. But to do it for Ben Duckett and Zach Crawley is uh, it's a whole different world, right? Yeah. But that tells you that Australia is playing a different form of cricket, and they're aware mm-hmm. of that. But again, as you said, that shows the effect of basketball. Absolutely, and I mean we've talked about a lot of things that England, well, they've gotten bad press for, or you know, have been hammered uh, for on social media. Let's talk about some of the interesting stuff. I'll start with something that was very, very bizarre. We've obviously spoken a lot about England's military, medium militia, which Mark Wood has just come out and he steamrolled all of that. But Harry Brook, as part of that medium <laughs> military militia, uh, what's your take on that? That was very fascinating, wasn't it? Him bowling four overs, I think. Was it three overs? Something like that? Th- that kind of reminds me of how far England have come in this series. Mm. If they'd have done that at Headingley, I think... yeah. Uh, we still would have been we would have been surprised we were surprised when it happened at Edgbaston but, but mm. if they'd done that at Headingley I do think it would have gone against the way they were playing whereas I don't think mm. it did at Edgbaston they'd already done the early declaration right they'd already attacked mm. really hard they already played right. a bunch of shots that were a bit bizarre and, and everything else whereas now it does feel in this last test like they played baseball when they needed to play baseball they played mm. defensive when they needed to play defensive They've Definitely. got many different gears that they're trying, many different plans mm-hmm. that they're trying. But the fact that Harry Brook bowled, I think it was first change. Wasn't it? it was something ridiculous. Something uh, like that. He bowled yeah, very, very early. The ball was still fairly new. Exactly. Um, hmm. To Steve Smith. Just shows you that they, at that stage, were probably feeling that they're invincible. Hmm. And if, now I just don't think they feel that way anymore. Now I think they know hmm. that... Well, once I lost the second test specifically... I think they mm-hmm. just went, we're in for a scrap here. That doesn't yeah. mean that we don't think we can win the series because I'm sure they still did and they should still have felt that way. But I do think at that point, that's the, that is where like, they, they really did change the way they played. And so if they did that at Old Trafford in the next test, we'd all be like, what? Not <laughs> what, not what as if this is funny, let's make some jokes on Twitter. We'd be like, actually, yeah. what's happening? As, as, uh, as they pressed a random generator on, in, mm. in their screen. And the same with Mo and Ali. When Moen Ali came out to bat number three, mm. there was a first thing of like, why has Moen Ali come out to bat number three? But then the you start, Mohawk, as yeah. someone said on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. But then when you start to sort of work back from that a little bit, you start mm. to think, well, wait a minute. They, that moves Harry Brook down the order. Mm-hmm. It allows Moen Ali to play in a certain way. They have a left-hander up the order. Up the order. That's yep. sensible baseball. Didn't work, right? Mm-hmm. It didn't work, and that's fine. But that's sensible baseball. As in, that's baseball... With, with knowledge whereas mm. Harry Brook bowling was baseball because that's funny yeah uh, no no most definitely I mean very very valid points that you bring up uh, a little bit more on England of course they have that win in he- with heading Lee and I'd say the one other shining light for them that beacon of hope somewhat has been Ben Stokes right he's scored that Marvellous 155, otherworldly really at Lords, And then he followed that up with an 80 at Headingley. Of course, Headingley is his happy hunting ground. And uh, that 80 runs, they weren't very smooth, right? He had a very, very faulty knee. It was barely working. And the way he just stood firm from one end and smashed Australia's bowlers for some huge sixes, Todd Murphy in particular, you'd have to say that was one of the more fantastic sort of weird uh, runs of play that we've seen all series. Yeah, I think I'd be very interested to see where the Ben Stokes innings mm. um, eventually ends up, right? So, did you, did you mention both of the Ben Stokes innings in that? Or yeah, it, 155 and then 80. Yeah. Because the 80 will be forgotten because it was in the first innings, right? Mm-hmm. But it was a really, really I, there was no part of his body working by the end. It was Absolutely I mean, not. I, you see a lot of ridiculous things in cricket, but seeing mm. a man stick his fingers into Ben Stokes's ass, he's got to be <laughs> right up there, right? And then for him to go from that to hitting the ball the way that he did, you know, and then almost falling over after hitting the ball because he was losing his shape and everything, it, it was just a, a miraculous moment. But the 150 itself, when you go back to that innings, mm. if they win that test match, it probably goes down as better than the heading the innings, right? Probably one of the best ever. I mean, probably the best ever because Lords occasions don't get bigger than that. And then I think at Headingley, he still had 
not as many runs to score, right? When he started hitting. Over here, he had far too many. Yeah, I think that's wrong. right. I have to go back and go yeah. through it. I, mm -hmm. I was at both, and I thought the Lord's one was technically better. I thought he was smarter mm -hmm. at Lords. I thought he got a bit lucky at Headingley. I didn't think he yeah. got particularly lucky at Lords at all. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so look, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. But yeah, it's it's because of what happened with Bearstow and everything else. It mm -hmm. just sort of disappeared that innings. And yeah, you know, we just talked. To, we we did an episode of Uncovered where I talked about the, the great thing about the Bearstow incident, the mm -hmm. Edge Baston Test match, and this last Test match is that. Non-cricket people are talking about cricket, and it's fantastic. Mm. It bring new people in and everything else. But the problem with that, of course, is that they will talk about what they want to talk about, and instead of mm -hmm. saying, Besto did this thing, and even if you did want a narrative drive, it's like, Besto did this thing, he made a mistake, Australia did this thing, and then Ben Stokes did this. The Ben Stokes yeah. thing, part of it was taken out. And mm. that innings hasn't got the correct context that I think it deserves mm. to get um, going ahead. And I really do think it was an absolute masterclass I don't know if I thought it was better than uh, Leeds, all, all things considered. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd have to go back and think about it. But I, I did think at the time, this is absolutely one of the best innings I've ever seen. And mm -hmm. there's, there, there, I, you couldn't, I don't think you can convince me otherwise. And I've seen, I don't know, <laughs> even if we just go live, I've probably seen 200 test matches at this point <laughs> in my life. So um, I feel like I've seen 200 test matches in the last month, if we're being honest. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's a very interesting one, of course. Um, so much has happened in this Ashes. I mean, we've, we're have we recording this podcast on all the weird shit that's gone on, but we'd probably not be able to even scratch the surface. We've, we're trying hard, but we'd probably not be able to get close because we're not even talking about all the things that have been said, right? Matthew Hayden you know, calling Ollie Robinson a forgettable cricketer for bowling 75, 75 miles per hour nude nuts. I think that was my favorite comment from all the Ashes. And then Glenn McGrath losing his shit on comms, also very on brand with Glenn McGrath. But I guess just on a closing note, would you th what would you think would happen first? Would Baz McCullum have a beer with Australians first? Or would Zach Crawley <laughs> success or successfully predict a test match in the future first uh, or before the Baz McCullum beer? The, the McCullum beer thing, I, it didn't get mentioned that much. After, I mean, obviously mm. it made press. But it is weird to think that Dan Vittori is in the change room. Uh, yeah of the opposition change room and mm. i'm trying to think if there's anyone else in that change room he might be friends with as well it's a really mm. weird thing to do also you're talking about a guy who routinely in his career like okay so mccullum twice did this and then 10 years mm. later apologized for one of them right mm -hmm. and and then and then the other one was the um the uh you know the match fixing situation where he was approached for match fixing at any mm. time within the next whatever it was, three or four years, he could have been done for match fixing and wasn't. Um, and so in the end, he came out of that like a golden god because mm. he finally came forward all those years later. But if he'd been caught a year earlier, he would have been suspended for you know two to five years probably. Mm -hmm. um, so he's a man who's more than used to making mistakes. And it mm -hmm. shows you the absolutism of this. And this is part of the, the genius of the ashes. This isn't in my piece, and so I'm going to go completely off piece here a little bit for you. And I'm going to try and explain sure. everything, all the hype and all the nonsense in one go. Hmm. There's two kinds of cricket in England, and it's really important that everyone knows this. It's not quite the same in Asia, not quite the same in Australia. I would say hmm. it's not quite the same in some of the other countries around the world. But specifically in England, there's two kinds of cricket. There is cultural cricket. Mm -hmm. And then there is actual cricket. Cultural cricket is cucumber sandwiches. It's the mm -hmm. sweater vests. It's, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's going to an event for Waitrose um, that where a bunch of people are going to be talking about cricket, right? That it's going to Death of a Gentleman, my film, um, mm -hmm. to sit there and go, oh, young people are ruining everything and all these sorts yeah. of things, right? It's really, really strong in England, this cultural cricket. Mm -hmm. And then you have actual cricket. The most important series in the world at the moment is Australia-India. It's not the mm. Ashes, right? If India and Pakistan ever just got over all the issues and played their test series, that would be the number one most important mm -hmm. thing in the world. The two World Cups are also more important than the Ashes, right? Fair enough. But England is so much of England cricket. And you go back through all the nonsense we've talked about, you know, the Piers Morgan and 
being on TV and I don't know if I've told this story on a podcast yet, but the whole thing of like, you know, being on a TV show talking about the stumping and being told off for laughing too much about it um, after the segment before was on the French riots, right? <laughs> they, every, there's this big cultural thing and the ashes are really only important from a cultural hmm. perspective. And I say this because most of the years that I've covered the ashes, we have not had mm -hmm. the two best teams in the world, right? It's yeah. very rare. This might be a case where it depends on how you feel about India right at the moment and, and Bumrah's injury and everything else and Rishabh Pant's injury. But you would say that at the very least, England, Australia are top three and they're put, both pushing, you know, for number one, number two um, team in the world. Hmm. But what has happened in this particular Ashes is what happens in good Ashes and what happens even in bad Ashes, which is no one cares. It doesn't matter hmm. if one team's ranked fourth and one team's ranked sixth, right? In the 80s, you had two teams that weren't particularly playing very well. The people who Fair played enough. in the 80s are still, doing, are still going to cricket events. They're still coaches. They're still commentators, right? Based on things they did in Ashes that wasn't even important in the <laughs> 80s, right? And 40 <laughs> years later, they're still talking. Gladstone Small was not... Uh, I think he's a really good bowler, but he's, he didn't play a whole bunch of cricket, but he played cricket at the right time. Right, and yeah. he was remembered for that, and you know the neck thing helped as well. Let's we're glad to be yeah. small, um, but the point is that for context, I mean, even people in Pakistan remember Gladstone Small, so that's how yeah. big of an impact he had. <laughs> he he did have a big impact, but there are lots of the best way of putting this. It's a few years ago. I, I won't compare the cricketers because I I don't want because they they're trying to build careers outside of cricket now. But there were two mm -hmm. cricketers, and I think one cricketer had played like eighty or ninety test matches. But for whatever reason, hadn't play, hadn't done as much in the Ashes, and hadn't and had probably played most of the Ashes, I would say, um, in losing causes, mm -hmm. right? And the other cricketer had played far fewer Test matches. Obviously, wasn't as good as the other player, but had played right. uh, very very well in it must have been the 05 Ashes, mm -hmm. or at least an Ashes that was popular. It might have been later than that. I can't even remember now for the, the, this cricketer. But um, and the cultural fit of that was of course that the 2005 Ashes was bigger and that the other mm. person hadn't been as good as in the Ashes. They'd been a fantastic cricketer, but they hadn't mm -hmm. really cracked the Ashes. And so English cricket has this culture around it that Australia doesn't really get for the Ashes. Australia has a different mm -hmm. relationship with the Ashes than what England has with it. And so all this nonsense that we're talking about is the cultural stuff, right? Uh -huh. you're, not, you're not seeing articles about, um, uh, about fielding placements from hmm. from non cricket writers, right? You're not seeing right. Piers Morgan go on and say, "Well, the problem here is that we should have played. If we played Josh Chung here, we would have already won this Test match, hmm. and we've kept Australia in it or anything else." Right? That's what you would hear in India, right? That's what you hear hmm. in Pakistan. That's even what you hear in Australia. You go to Australia and the Ashes are on, and like suddenly it's like, I can't believe we picked you know Xavier Dolby when yeah. Michael Beer should be playing in the <laughs> game, right? In England, Mike, the Michael Beers and the Xavier Dolbys, does, it doesn't even exist. Right, it's it's about the culture of cricket, and it's why mm -hmm. it's a fantastic, <coughs> it's why it's a fantastically weird series when you don't even have the best teams in the world. The World right. Cup has just been played. The World Cup's more important. India is so important to cricket. All these other things are more important than the mm. Ashes. But in this cultural landscape of England, the Ashes just are going to remain as such an important thing. Even as sometimes us as cricket fans, we're just like. Oh, God, and Ashes, and we've got the third best team going up against the sixth best team. Oh, great. <laughs> Yay! Right? But it doesn't matter because everything gets built up around it. And so all this nonsense that we're talking about, actually, and, and if you're an Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, Bangladeshi mm. fan, you know about the nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. You and I both know about, you know, Safraz's yawn, right? Yeah. You know, all that, all that sort of stuff that happens in that... The, in, in every day and Crick Ecstasy and Crick Adder mm. and all those weird cricket aggregator sites just keep putting it, you know, Virat Kohli <laughs> eats food in change room and <laughs> smiles, all that, all that sort of stuff, right? Doesn't yeah. exist in English cricket at any mm. stage until the Ashes. And then yeah. suddenly the Ash, cricket in England goes like simmering it at like one and a half to like mm. literally a white, a white hot flame. Is white hot flame the highest flame or is it the blue flame that's the highest flame? It goes very hot is my point mm. right and it goes completely yeah. from nowhere and suddenly it happens and so the nonsense just overflows right and we end up with Bearstow being the biggest story in England for three days over <laughs> illegal stumping 
right? We have <laughs> Alex Carey's non-existent haircut becoming a story. Mm. And these things come out and I think it, it just attaches itself to this organism. And I'd mm. really be interested to see where the Ashes is in 10, 15, 20 years' time because Australia doesn't mm. have the same relationship with England that it used to have, right? Australia, yeah. you know, when I was growing up, England was still seen as the mother country. It's mm. not really the mother country of Australia anymore. There's so, many, so much immigration. You know, the First mm-hmm. Nations people don't really want to see England as the mother country because they yeah. kind of see it as the mother that beat them, right? You know, there's yeah. all these different issues, you know, and, and people who come from different backgrounds in Sudanese, Sri Lankan, you know, um, uh, Chinese people who live in Australia, they don't see England in that same way, right? But within England, the ashes, and, and you, this, is why, this is what held England cricket back for so long, of course, because they mm. were only obsessed with the ashes. And I would say that the management of English cricket is much better now than it's ever been when it comes to that. But yeah, the, that's a f- the culture and the nonsense, Bayram. Oh, hmm. you can't. Good luck unpicking that <laughs> because there are so many people when you talk to them in English cricket and you ask them what cricket is, they literally just say the ashes. And that's all it is. And that's why we have Zach Crawley's nonsense and everything else. But I do think it's much more likely that Baz McCullum will have a beer with Dan Vittori than it is that <laughs> Zach Crawley will ever make another stupid prediction, hopefully ever. And literally, if he does do it again, at least he will factor in the fact that they may bat first or bowl first. Yeah, I don't particularly have my money on Zach Crawley making it as a psychic in the future. But yeah, that was a great bit of context. Of course, all this culture and nonsense, it's providing us with great entertainment, great drama, makes for great viewing, and we're all hooked to the ashes. So what else do we want? But anyway, thanks for your time, Jared. And thanks to everyone who tuned in. It's been fantastic having this conversation because what do you know? What what can you even predict that will happen in the remainder of this Ashes series? Two more tests to go. We'll catch you soon next week once again for episode 9 of Footmarks. That's all for now. Goodbye.